that's one area where Christian values are out of step with modern society. It's the area of sex. In the past, people generally accepted Christian principles in this area, didn't necessarily live by them. But they accepted that they were a good foundation for society. Nowadays, especially as far as the elites concerned, those who run the media, those in positions of power, Christian morality is rejected and scorned. People demand their sexual freedom to do whatever they want, with whomever they want and to do it without any kind of criticism. Indeed, they demand that their choices should be celebrated. Any form of disapproval is labelled bigotry, hatred. Why did Matt Hancock have to resign as a government minister? Not because he had an affair, but because in having that affair he broke social distancing rules. <coughs> Much more serious in modern eyes. In that kind of society, it's not easy to live by Christian standards. There's pressure to conform to the attitudes of society. It can be costly to speak out. It also gives Christians an opportunity. Because the sexual revolution hasn't brought liberation. It's brought misery, confusion. And so we have the opportunity to model a better way to live. And that better way is the way which God lays down in his commandments. He didn't give these commandments to make us miserable, to frustrate us. He gave them for our good. He's our creator. He knows what is best for us. And as a loving God, he wants what is good for us. So we need to have confidence God's way is best, even when those around find our values strange, outlandish. So let's look at that seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. To put the title of a recent book, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? And the first answer to that question is, because of what it says about God. Because of what it says about God. If I asked you to describe the character of God, what words would you use? Holy, obviously. Almighty, all-knowing, loving. But it wouldn't be long before you came to that word, faithful. Know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. The psalmist says, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. <coughs> As we read from Lamentations, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Notice how in all those three quotations, God's faithfulness is closely linked with his mercy, with his steadfast love. It's a Hebrew word chesed. It occurs many times in the Old Testament. It's a beautiful word. It's very hard to portray its meaning by a single English term. It's a faithful, loyal love, mercy and grace, binding a man to his Lord and to his neighbour, his friend. And this is what God is like. He's a faithful God, a covenant-keeping God, a loyal, a merciful, a gracious God. And that's why he prohibits adultery. Because adultery is the exact opposite of his nature. Sexual sin lies about the Creator. It misrepresents his character. So here's the first point. Take nothing else from the sermon. Take this. God is faithful. God is faithful. You can always rely on him. If you trust him, he'll never let you down. He'll never abandon you. God is faithful. And he wants us to be faithful. What do we find when we look into our hearts? 
is there that same commitment to faithfulness? How important is it to us that we be reliable in every area of our lives? As with the sixth commandment, Jesus goes beyond the outward act. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's not talking about a casual glance at someone. He's not talking about noticing that someone's attractive. He's speaking about that lingering look, the mental undressing, the imagination, what it would be like to use that person sexually. If you look at a woman to arouse, to cultivate, to nurture sexual desire, then you're committing adultery with her. Sexual attraction isn't sin. But gazing at a woman other than your wife to arouse sexual desire is. And it makes no difference whether that person is standing in front of you, or you're looking at an image on a screen or in a magazine, or even a mental image conjured up by words in the page on the novel you're reading. Fantasizing about sex outside marriage is wrong. Perhaps you should go further. Graham Bainan suggests it must also include romantic or emotional fantasy. You don't necessarily imagine having sex with someone you're not married to, but you imagine intimacy or romance with them. It's easy to deceive yourself in this area, to try to sidestep the command, to evade its force. Remember an example Tony Hutter once used. A man knows he must be faithful to his wife. He allows himself to think about what might happen if she died, so that he was free to consider somebody else. The command probes the heart, not just the outward actions. To borrow the language of the Westminster Larger Catechism, it includes the body, mind, affections, words, and behaviour. We look up, we see God's faithfulness. We look in, we examine our own hearts. And then we look ahead to Jesus Christ. And we see that Jesus perfectly kept this commandment. In the Gospels we see him interacting with a variety of women. From the most respectable to the most disreputable. Think of the woman at the well for instance. There's never a hint of impurity. Even when he's associating with prostitutes. And of course, scripture portrays him as the bridegroom of the church. Ephesians tells us, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Christ is faithful to his bride. He isn't promiscuous. He doesn't please himself with self-indulgence. He gives himself sacrificially for his bride. He intends to see her holy and without blemish. And here's good news for those who know they fail to keep this commandment. God doesn't cast away those who come to him in repentance and faith. Christ works to transform them, to remove every spot, every blemish, every imperfection. And that means that we also must not reject those who are sinners in this area. We mustn't turn away from them in disgust as though they're something beneath us. Certainly we must not allow sexual sin within the church. We must be ready to share God's love for sinners with those sinners. We must assure them, all who turn from their sins, whatever those sins, however blatant, however appalling they seem, those who come to Christ in repentance will be pardoned. 
They will be accepted. They will be received into his family. We look ahead, we see Christ as the bridegroom preparing, beautifying his church. And then we look down at the path of our feet. How do we set about keeping the commandment? Brian Edwards comments that marriage is sustained more by loyalty, faithfulness and commitment than by heady romance. I want to suggest two main principles for you this morning. First, honour marriage. And second, flee from sexual immorality. So that's the first one then, honour marriage. The writer to the Hebrews tells us marriage is honourable among all and the bed undefiled but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Whether you are married or unmarried, young or old, the command to honour marriage applies to you. Society has a love-hate relationship with marriage, doesn't it? On the one hand, it loves weddings. And it praises those who've been happily married for decades. Think of the late Queen Elizabeth, 70 plus years of marriage to Prince Philip, her rock, as she described him. But on the other hand, it doesn't expect that to be the norm. It often sees marriage as outdated, boring, restrictive. Government policy doesn't encourage marriage, doesn't reward faithfulness. It doesn't matter how many studies demonstrate that a stable marriage improves medical, mental and physical and economic outcomes for the whole family. Social policy won't favour marriage over other arrangements. There are well-funded pressure groups that are only too ready to criticise any hint of marriage is best. But in that context, we must honour marriage. Those of us who are married need to demonstrate the benefits of marriage by our own example of commitment and faithfulness. But for all of us, whether married or not, the way that we think and speak about marriage is important. If we honour marriage, we'll hold it in high esteem. We'll think of it as a precious thing. We'll speak well of it. We'll want to say things that support marriage in general, specific marriages in particular. We'll hate saying anything that would undermine marriage. We want to honour rather than endanger marriages in what we do. And that's not always easy, is it? Especially when either we or the people we're speaking to have experienced the pain and heartache of a broken marriage. This is a fallen world. The reality of marriage often falls far short of the ideal. And we mustn't exaggerate the benefits of marriage as though it's a cure for all the ills of society. Marriage is God's plan for human flourishing. But marriage is not God. It can't meet all our needs. those of us who are married, the way we think and speak about our own spouses is particularly important. You know what happen, comes immediately after that verse I quoted from Hebrews? Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Be content with what you have. Don't be comparing your spouse with someone else's spouse. Maybe someone else is better looking. Maybe they are better with the children. Maybe they are less liable to become stressed if work is busy. But God hasn't given them to you. You must focus your attention on the spouse you do have, not on someone else. Drink water from your own system. Running water from your own well. A friend of mine once talked about two ministers he knew who had left their wives for other women. He said the one common factor between those two men was that they tended to run down their wives to other, when speaking to other people. Anger, contempt towards a spouse, 
key values, both the spouse and the marriage union, creates a system for adulthood. And we need to be ready to help and encourage those who are married. A listening ear. Help with houseworking or childminding or maybe with granny sitting, providing a meal. Whatever ways are appropriate in that particular situation, as you have opportunity. And in speaking of marriage, we won't often have lengthy discussions with other people. But maybe sometimes we can make a comment or ask a question that, as it were, puts a stone in someone's shoe that troubles them. Something that gives them another way of thinking about the subject. I remember decades ago, one of my colleagues saying that she wouldn't marry anyone without first living with them to make sure they were compatible. Now, she wasn't speaking specifically to me, it was a comment to a room full of people. I didn't say anything. I've always regretted not asking a question. How does living with someone on the basis if you're not happy you can walk out prepare you for a relationship of lifelong commitment? The reality is that those who live together before marriage are far more likely to divorce than those who don't. Because they've entered marriage with a completely different mindset. So that's the first instruction here. Honour marriage. Value it. Encourage it. Defend it. And then the second instruction. Flee from sexual immorality. You'll find that command in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. Don't be casual about it. Run from it. As you'd run from a raging fire or a wild animal. As Joe did in that story I was telling. There's a story about a young boy who used to keep falling out of bed. When his mother asked him why, he thought, he replied, I think I go to sleep too near the edge. That's true of many Christians today. They go to sleep too near the edge. They're asking what they can get away with, how close they can go, instead of how far away they can keep. I like Philip Ryken's instruct illustration. He compares sex to superglue. <clears throat> Ever thought of that one? He says, since sex is like superglue, squeezing it out at the wrong time or in the wrong place always creates an awful mess. The wrong things get joined together and getting them unstuck again tears at the soul. This is why adultery is forbidden. It's because sex is a great force for good, but only when it is used to join one man and one woman for life. You know the story of David's fall into adultery. It happened in the spring of the year when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Amnon, besieged Rabba. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Franken points out, sexual sin is never just about sex. It's always connected to the rest of life. David never would have committed adultery if he'd been doing what God had called him to do. Instead, he abdicated his royal responsibility, retreated to his palace, and there in his isolation and idleness, he gave in to temptation. It shows how vulnerable we are to sexual sin when we're living for ourselves and not for others. What we do with our bodies is not just physical, but also spiritual. It comes from the deepest desires of the heart. One way to gain victory over sexual sin is to live self-sacrificially rather than self-indulgently. And to do so in every area of life. Godliness in one area promotes godliness in others. And that's a principle that has a much wider application, doesn't it, than just this area. 
godliness in one area promotes godliness in others. That story, of course, also shows how the eye is a window to sinful desire. If we want to gain victory over this sin, we need to learn to turn away a lustful gaze. Godly men have always understood that preserving sexual purity means being careful what we look at. And godly women do their best to assist by dressing modestly, not arousing sexual desire. In Ephesians 5, Paul warns against fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. He says such things should not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Obviously he doesn't mean that literally. He's speaking about them himself. You can't warn against them without mentioning them. What he's saying is that we should not only shun these sins, but avoid spending our time thinking and talking about them. Because thinking and talking about them can produce an atmosphere in which they are tolerated. They're considered normal. And that subtly promotes their practice. There shouldn't even be a hint of immorality among us. As Paul goes on, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting. <coughs> Three terms expressing a dirty mind, showing itself in vulgar conversation. Utterly inappropriate <coughs> among those whom God has set apart as holy. Smutty jokes must may be common in the workplace. We need to avoid them as the plague that they are. Flee sexual immorality. Let me point you to two motives with which Paul surrounds those instructions in Ephesians. First of all, he reminds us of Christ's example. Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us and offering the sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. As he says later in the chapter, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Christ didn't give in to sexual temptation. He didn't take the easy way out. He didn't live for his own pleasure. He gave himself in sacrificial life, love. Is that to free us from sin? Not just the penalty of sin, but the power eventually even the presence of sin. How can we treat lightly what cost him his life? That's the first motive, the love of Christ. What he has done for us, to free us from sin. And then secondly, Paul reminds us of God's judgment. No fornicator, unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Dying with temptation is playing with fire. Who gives the same warning to the Corinthians? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor cowardice, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Sober words. But of course then he goes on, and such were some of you. But you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. See, there is hope for the sexually broken. Yes, this sin is serious. It's damaging. It brings, eventually, damnation. But it is not unforgivable. It's not unforgivable. Such were some of you, he says, but not now. Now you have been washed. Now you have been sanctified. Now you have been justified. Now you are clean. Sin does not have the last word. <clears throat> Incidentally, did you notice how in those passages, he doesn't just talk about sexual sins, as though those are the only things that matter. He'll mention things like covetousness. 
just to avoid all sin, not to focus on one end and say, well, if I avoid that, I'm okay, and I can look down on other people. He challenges us in every area. And he says, some of you were like that, but not now. Sin doesn't have the last word. And so we look forward. What lies ahead for us as believers? John tells us in Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. God doesn't destroy the creation. He renews it. So the last creation holds glories that surpass the first. God created marriage as the most fundamental, the most intimate covenantal relationship between human beings. He uses that to communicate the kind of relationship that God will enjoy with his people. You see that picture there of that consummation where there's no more death, sorrow, crying, pain. What are the things that cause those things? Ultimately sin. Have you been hurt by some form of impurity? Have you been the, perfect, the victim or the perpetrator of sexual sin? Then trust Christ. And look forward to the glory, the purity, the cleanness of the new heaven, the new earth, the holy city. Because if you trust him, no defilement awaits you. It will be clean, holy, new. As one writer says, believer in Jesus. Do you feel some great tension in your life? Is there a massive sorrow in your heart that results from some sin or some disaster or some disappointment? God is going to dwell with you and comfort you. Find in that hope the resolution to all tension, the comfort for all sorrow, the healing from every disaster, the consolation that swallows up every disappointment. God is greater than all your pain. So if you're not a believer in Jesus, let me invite you to try to imagine something better than what this passage offers you. What could you desire that could be better than what this passage describes? A new heaven and earth, a holy city, the presence of God, comfort for all sorrow, protection from any future pain. What more could you want? Is what draws you away from God really better than this? Close with some words from Peter Lighthart. Sexual faithfulness in marriage and sexual purity outside of marriage aren't mere demands of law. Sexual faithfulness preaches the gospel. When a husband and wife are faithful to each other, sexually and otherwise, they become a created symbol of the covenant God who keeps his vows to Israel and the new Israel. By keeping the seventh word, we dramatise the good news of Jesus, the bridegroom of the church, who gives himself in utter fidelity to and for his bride. May God help us to be true pictures of Christ and his church.